This is Mid-Atlantic Women in Agriculture's Wednesday webinar, Understanding Buying and Selling Farmland. Our presenter today is Sarah Everhart. She has provided her email at the end of the presentation for any questions. Thank you to our sponsors, Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, Delaware Department of Agriculture, and Maryland Department of Agriculture. All upcoming presentations, along with all archived presentations, can be found at our website. Thanks for listening. I work for the Agriculture Law Education Initiative. I'm an attorney. My, um, my title is Research Associate and Legal Specialist. The Agriculture Law Education Initiative is a collaboration between the University of Maryland um, Francis King Carey School of Law, the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Maryland College Park, um, and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. There is our website, our Twitter um, handle, and our Facebook information. We are an Empower program, which means that we, um, we bring together the different um, bodies of the University of Maryland throughout the state to try to provide the best possible product and the best possible resources. Here is our website. Um, we have a, um, a variety of different um, publications, resources, links, um, stories and um, events that will probably be of interest to agricultural operators throughout the state. So if you get a chance, check out our website. There's a lot of good stuff on there. We also um, write for a blog that's sponsored by ALEI and the Crop Insurance Education Program. We do about three to four posts a week. It's a great place to find um, answers to common ag law questions. Um, we cover stories both nationally and stories that we think would be of interest to Maryland farmers. And finally, I want to plug our conference that's coming up on November 18th. It's going to be in Annapolis. It's an agriculture and environmental law conference. We're going to have a variety of topics um, throughout the day, including alternative energy on the farm, nutrient management regulation, uh, water quality in the bay. So register now. Um, it's going to be a great event. This is our second annual, and our keynote speakers this year will be Maryland Secretary of Ag, Joe Bartenfelder, Delaware Secretary of Ag, Ed Key, and Maryland Secretary of the Environment, Ben Grumble. So it's set to be a very interesting day, and we would love to have as many farmers as possible sign up and be there. All right, finally, moving on. I'm an attorney. I can't help myself. I have to give a disclaimer. Um, I'm just here today to talk about education. I'm not giving anyone individual advice. State laws definitely vary, um, especially on this topic of real estate. I'm focusing today on Maryland law and specifically um, on some of the provisions of the standard um, Maryland Association of Realtors contract. If you need individual advice, please consult your personal attorney. All right, so let's get into it. Buying and selling farmland. Farmland transactions, they're different from residential transactions in a lot of different ways. Um, we need to worry about things like soil health. Zoning is very important. Water um, access, access to water and access to the property itself. Relationships with neighbors can be very important in this day and age where um, a lot of folks are you know, moving into rural areas and farms are butting up against subdivisions. So the things I want to go over today, um, I want to talk about the roles and responsibilities in a typical purchase transaction, because I think sometimes people get a little bit confused about um, some of the roles. I want to go through some typical contract provisions, and I want everyone to understand the different documents. We, you know, Anybody that's been through a purchase of a piece of property, be it residential or farmland property, knows there's a lot of documents involved, um, and I think you know, folks tend to shut down a little bit around these documents. They sometimes can be difficult to understand, um, so I'm going to try to break those down and explain to you what each document means. One thing I really want to um, I really want to make sure that resonates today is that no one should sign documents that they don't understand. Um, I think sometimes in complex transactions, you know. You get a little bit intimidated, and um, everybody, you know, sitting at a closing table, and everybody wants to move on with their day, and lots of documents are shuffling around. But I really encourage everyone to um, 
So slow down and make sure you understand what you're signing before you sign it. If you don't understand it, don't sign it, um, and make sure that you ask and get terms explained to you. All right, so the first um, roles that I want to go over in the farmland purchase are um, some of the real estate agent roles. We have the seller's agent or the listing agent, the buyer's agent, and then we have the concept of dual agency. Um, oftentimes, attorneys are involved in real estate transactions. A really important thing to realize about an attorney in a real estate transaction is to hire that attorney before you sign the real estate contract. Before I worked for the Agriculture Law Education Initiative, I was an attorney in private practice um, in Easton in a rural area, and I was involved with some farmland transactions as well as many residential transactions, and I can't tell you how many times folks signed the contract you know, for the purchase and then hired me afterwards, brought me the signed contract and said, you know, I just worked this out with the realtors and with the seller, Will you take a look at this and make sure that I did everything right, or will you make sure this contract protects me? And I would just rub my head um, out of frustration, thinking, well, you already signed the contract. There's very little I can do for you at this point. I can explain what you've already committed yourself to, but if you've signed it, you're already committed. So it's important if you decide to get an attorney involved to get that attorney involved before you sign anything. All right, and then um, a surveyor. Surveyor is very important, and I'll go over the reasons why. And lastly, the title company. Um, states handle this differently, um, but uh, in Maryland, there's attorneys involved in the title company transactions. Sometimes the title examiner is not an attorney, but there's normally an attorney reviewing. Um, and I think folks get a little bit confused about title insurance and what exactly that is um, providing. So we're going to talk about that. And then an appraiser, um, which, you know, the appraiser is going to be verifying the value for the lender. All right, realtors. You know, we're all familiar with real estate agents. Real estate agents can provide a lot of helpful information. There's a lot of realtors that are specifically um, focused on farmland transactions, so they can be great assets. One thing to remember is that the standard real estate contract used by realtors in Maryland was created by the State Association of Realtors. Um, so we can infer about who is protected by that contract. The contract really protects realtors extremely well since they created it. So it's just something to keep in mind. The seller's agent works for the real estate company that lists and markets the property. Um, the seller's agent's role is um, really to sell that property. He or she may assist the buyer, but their duty of loyalty is really to the seller. Um, this may sound like a simple elementary thing to say, but roles can get um, easily confused in these situations. For example, you see a piece of property you're interested in, you see the for sale sign on it, maybe when you're driving down the road, you pick up the phone, you call, you go look at the property. The agent is providing a lot of helpful information. Um, you know, they're encouraging you to buy. They're um, giving you assistance. Sometimes folks get confused as to whether or not, as to who that agent is then working for. If they're providing the buyer with assistance, it can seem as though they're acting as your real estate agent. But really, unless you have your own separate agent, they're ultimately working for the seller. A buyer's agent is going to assist you in buying and evaluating properties, and they're going to be working in your best interest. If you want someone working in your best interest, it's your, your best course is to get your own realtor. Um, and then that buyer's um, agent fee is going to depend on the, on the agreement you have. And then finally, we have dual agency. Um, some states disallow dual agency. In Maryland, we are allowed to have a dual agency relationship. Um, if you have a dual agency relationship, that means that you have one agent that represents both parties, or the seller's agent and the buyer's agent are actually affiliated with the same real estate agency. Um, if there's a dual agency situation, you should be presented with an agreement where you agree to the dual agency in writing. So it shouldn't be something that just kind of happens. If a dual agency presents itself, um, you should be able to consent to that before it goes on. 
All right, a lawyer. Why hire a lawyer in a real estate transaction? Um, I got this question a lot, and I get it now, and I got it when I was in private practice. Do I really need a lawyer? If I have two real estate agents, you know, that already seems like a lot of folks involved in a transaction, and especially if the real estate agents are knowledgeable, why do we need to spend the money and get one more person involved? Well, lawyers can be very valuable in real estate transactions. Um, they negotiate the contract terms, and they're going to make sure that that contract protects the client. A lawyer is not working for the sale. Um, they're working for their individual client, and they have very strict ethical requirements. I know we all hear um, lawyer jokes, but um, okay, thanks Liz. Thanks for that comment. Um, Liz says she's a Maryland realtor, dual agency, not possible by an individual agent, only by a broker. Okay. Um, so Moving on about the lawyers, lawyers verify zoning, read and interpret covenants, and easements. So a lawyer is going to do the homework in terms of can you do what you want to do with your specific property. Um, zoning regulations with ag are getting more complicated by the minute. Um, I think we've, um, those of us on the eastern shore have all heard about, you know, the increased zoning focus on poultry farming. Um, similar situations with um, equine situations, and there's a lot of, you know, anytime you have a CAFO, depending on the type of ag operation you want to have, zoning can have a big impact. If you're talking about agritourism, you're going to have some very strict zoning requirements um, that's going to dictate where you can have that actual operation. So a lawyer is going to do that type of homework for you. They're going to have that specialized knowledge. They can also read and interpret covenants and easements. A lot of farmland have or are subject to covenants and easements, whether that's access easements um, or um, old covenants uh, regarding property rights. And so a lawyer is going to be able to sit down and, um, and help you through all of that. They can also explain the exceptions to your title insurance coverage. Um, and I'll go through that in a few minutes when I talk about the title company. Um, they can provide guidance on right to farm laws. We have um, quite, uh, we have right to farm laws in Maryland at the state level, and then counties also have their own right to farm laws. And if you're buying a piece of ag property that is near residential property and you fear that you could potentially have an issue with neighbors, um, it's very important to understand right to farm laws and how they can protect you. Um, and finally, I made reference to this at the beginning, a lawyer gets paid whether or not the sale occurs. Um, when I was in private practice, I helped people with a lot of real estate transactions that actually never happened. Uh, people were interested in pieces of property, especially you know when you're talking about unimproved pieces of property, and they thought it was a great deal, they thought it was the perfect piece of property for them, but after I had done some digging, um, be it easements or zoning or access or any host of issues, they decided they didn't want to buy that piece of property and they walked away. They were able to walk away because they had hired a lawyer to do the homework before they signed the contract and to them that was valuable. So that's, um, that's the lawyer's role. A surveyor, why are you going to hire a surveyor? Um, sometimes surveyors are hired um, from the lender, a mortgage company is going to require a surveyor, sometimes they're not. Why would you want to hire one? Well, the most important reason to hire a surveyor in a purchase transaction is that nobody in the transaction, not the realtors, not the attorneys, not the title company, is going to ensure that you're actually getting the acreage described in the deed. This is an important thing to think about and remember. Um, sometimes during a real estate transaction, you're handed in uh, a drawing, an, an old recorded plat, or the seller or the real estate agent will walk you around the property, you know, point you towards a tree line and tell you, you know, you're, this is what you're buying. You're buying from here to here to here, and it stops at that tree line or it, start, it stops at that barn. Um, but that really doesn't tell you anything, and it's very common for people to um, encounter acreage shortages in real estate transactions, and the only way to prevent that is to hire a surveyor. 
They're going to walk the property. They're going to verify the boundaries and the acreage, and they're the ones that are going to discover discrepancies before you buy. Um, don't make any assumptions, um, and whatever you're told by, you know, agents or anyone else involved, it's really not going to hold up unless you've hired a surveyor. It's really the best way to protect yourself, especially when you're talking about unimproved property like farmland. All right, let's go through some of the common contract provisions. One thing I wanted to say at the outset is that a contract is not the offer. It's the agreement to buy and sell. I think sometimes people get a little bit um, muddled in terms of they go see a property they're interested in and they want to make an offer and they sign the real estate contract and then they get it back and it's signed by the other party and everything moves a little fast and I think this is where people get confused about um, uh, whoa maybe I should have hired an attorney before I signed that. That, um, the contract of sale, once you have put the offer down and you have signed it as the buyer and the si seller has signed it, that's the entire real estate contract. So just be aware of that. Who's the buyer? Think about who you want to buy the property. Um, are you going to be buying it as an individual? Are you going to be buying it as a couple if you have a spouse, a partner? Um, or are you going to be buying it as a business entity? Do you want to form a business entity to buy the property beforehand, or do you have an existing business entity? Understand the payment terms. Um, understand what's going to happen to your deposit if the deal falls through. Um, this is something that can be negotiated, and it might be an important thing to have negotiated. And understand your obligation, if you're the buyer in the scenario, to pursue financing. Or if you're the seller, understand what the buyer has to do to pursue financing. Settlement date. You're going to have to choose a settlement date um, and make sure you're realistic about this. If you're going to need to do um, a lot of environmental studies, if you're going to want to do a soil analysis, et cetera, you're going to want to choose a, so a settlement date that will allow for the inspections to occur and allow for you to review those inspections, um, reflect on them, and also for you to acquire financing if financing is involved. So don't feel rushed and pick a realistic settlement date. Okay, environmental inspection provisions, what do you need to know? These are some of the common things that folks, um, or reasons why folks pursue the environmental inspection provisions. They want to look for underground storage tanks. Underground storage tanks can be very expensive to um, have removed. They can present environmental hazards, so that's something that you might want to investigate, especially with older um, properties who um, use those for fuel Soil analysis, do you want to look at previous soil tests? Do you want to have your own soil test done? Um, lead paint, if you're talking about uh, a property that has some tenant buildings on it or an old farmhouse and you're planning on having it rented, you're going to want to make sure that there, um, there's no lead paint or that there's the proper lead paint certifications because that can also be very costly. Um, and lead paint in um, farm tenant buildings is pretty common. Um, mold. And uh, water quality, obviously, very important. Think about with the environmental inspection, what happens if the buyer is displeased with the results. So the inspection addendums that you're going to have to your typical contract give you some options. And you can um, pick the options that work best for you. Um, if you find something that you don't like on the inspection result, do you want the buyer to be able to back out of the deal and get the deposit back and walk away? If you're the buyer, do you want to just be able to um, basically nullify the contract and walk away? Or if you're the seller, do you want to have the right to remedy the condition so that the, um, the contract stays alive, so to speak? So these are things to think about. You've got to basically put your Debbie Downer um, hat on and think about the worst case scenario so if you get bad results back from those inspections, make sure before you sign that contract that your inspection addendums provide clearly what will happen in the event that you get an inspection result back that you don't like. This is, a, um, this is an area where if you leave it gray, it can really cause a lot of problems. Um, 
and then you're stuck in a contract and you're not happy with how things are going to proceed. All right, and another important thing is the inclusion provision. What is included in the contract? You've got to get it in writing. Um, gates, sheds, fence posts, um, you know, don't be afraid to get as detailed as possible as equipment. Um, if you want things that are on that piece of farmland, when you go to see it, put it in the contract just to make it crystal clear that you want those to go with the sale. Also, an important thing to talk about is existing leases. Are there existing farming leases? Are there tenants? What about hunting leases? And if there are existing leases, are they in writing? If they are, get a copy of them, um, review them, make sure you're comfortable with them. If the lease doesn't terminate upon the sale, which is the typical way leases, a lot of leases don't terminate upon sale, what are your obligations? Be aware of what you're buying into. If it's an oral lease, a good practice is to try to get something in writing between the existing tenant um, and the existing seller defining the terms of the relationship. You want to make sure it's crystal clear. Um, ag leases are difficult to terminate in Maryland. It typically requires six months. so. Um, you want to make sure that those relationships are nailed down, and if you don't have anything in writing, get something in writing um, so that there's no confusion or issues later on down the road. Um, sewage disposal, if you're talking, um, if you have residential properties out on the farmland, do you need a perk test, a percolation test? If so, is there already a valid recorded percolation test, or will you have time to get one performed? This can only be done seasonally, so this is a good thing to take a trip over to the county health department and talk to them about. Um, make sure you understand your requirements. If you're planning on renovating an existing house, are you going to need a new um, septic system? Um, and that's going to require a whole new uh, set of testing. Okay, contract provisions. Um, one contract provision that seems to give people uh, a headache is, except as otherwise specified in this contract, the property is sold as is. What does that mean? Basically, it means that the contract must specify the inspections the buyer wants and what the inspection results allow the buyer seller to do. So it basically means you're going to get what you're going to get. You're going to get it as is unless you have entered into addendums into, that are made a part of the contract saying that you want XYZ inspected, that you want to have some experts go out there and take a look. And unless you have made those choices, you're getting what the buyer is selling and you're not asking for anything more. So it's really up to the buyer to ask for what he or she wants in terms of homework with the property. In a residential situation, a seller has um, the obligation to make disclosures of certain latent defects. Okay, one contract provision that, um, that um, I wanted to point out is in the deed and title paragraph of the standard real estate contract. It's kind of buried in the middle, and I think folks skip over it. And it provides that buyer assumes the risk that restrictive covenants, zoning, or other recorded documents may restrict or prohibit the use of property for the purpose intended by the buyer. What does that mean? That basically means, um, like I have been sort of saying time and time again today, is that the buyer is assuming the risk that there could be covenants or zoning or other reasons that the buyer can't use the property for what he or she wants to use the property for. The buyer is assuming all that risk, so it's totally on the buyer to hire an attorney or to do some digging on their own to try to figure out and make sure that they can do what they want to do with the property regardless of what anybody else has promised or regardless of what the property is currently being used for. Some folks just assume that they can continue to use the property for what it's been used for in the past, but that might not necessarily be true. Basically, it's the buyer's responsibility. Okay, 
Farm crops, timber rights. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, this is a provision in um, the standard unimproved land contract in Maryland. Seller or tenant of seller shall be allowed to harvest, sell, or assign any annual crops which have been planted on the property prior to the date of contract acceptance, even though the harvest time happens subsequent to the date of the settlement unless otherwise agreed. So that basically means that if you're the buyer and you're buying this property and there's crops in the ground when you have both signed, buyer and seller, the contract, that the seller or the tenant of the seller has the right to come on the property 30, 60, 90 days after you've bought it and harvest those crops, unless you've agreed otherwise. So this harkens back to my previous comment about if there is a tenant on farming the property, best practice is to get something in writing from that tenant if there's not a written lease. If timber, neither the seller nor the tenant of the seller shall have a right to harvest the timber unless agreed otherwise in an addendum to the contract. So if you're buying property with timber, you need to work that out separately. Conservation easements. Um, if there's a conservation easement on the property, there should be an addendum to your contract, and you should also get a copy of the easement that you can take a look at. Read it. Um, again, I know it's legal mumbo jumbo, and um, it you know it makes gives some folks an instant headache. But read it and understand it. And if you can't read it and understand it, hire an attorney who can understand it and explain it to you. Easements vary. Conservation easements have very different terms. It's not a standard situation. They're all a little different, um, and they may preclude you from doing things that you want to do with the property. Examples agritourism type uses, um, alternative energy, they're all different. They all have um, different prohibitions. And if you buy a piece of property and it had that conservation easement addendum and the conservation easement was provided to you, you had notice of it and you're not going to have a leg to stand on later on if you're not happy that you can't do what you want to do with the farmland because of the terms of a conservation easement. They're extremely difficult to um, amend, I would say uh, impossible. And so just understand that if you're buying land subject to easement, you're buying land subject to all the terms of that easement. All right, so I've talked a lot about today about negotiating a contract. Well, how do you modify a standard realtor contract, the standard um, Maryland Association of Realtor Contract, which is what most folks are going to be dealing with? The best way to modify it is to strike through a provision and have both parties initial it. That is a totally valid way to modify a contract. Strike through, have both parties initial. Um, if you want something that's not included, have an addendum, have both parties sign and initial the addendum, sign or initial the addendum. If you're trying to do this on your own without an attorney, you can proceed that way. Okay, some other documents that are involved in your standard um, farm real estate transaction. You have your ag declaration of intent. I get folks asking me a lot of questions about this. Um, when you're signing your ag declaration of intent, you're promising to keep the land in ag use for five years following the sale. You're doing that to avoid agricultural transfer tax. Your ag use designation significantly lowers your property tax assessment. So you're going to have a significantly lower property tax assessment than the average Joe because it's an ag use. What happens if in year three, after you've signed that declaration of intent, you decide you want to change the use of the property? Failure to maintain the ag use triggers um, a, a couple requirements. You have to inform um, your local State Department of Assessments and Taxation office that it's no longer in ag use and it's going to result in some um, a tax calculation payment and penalty depending on where you are in that five years. I wrote, I've written a um, pretty comprehensive blog post on this so if you have more questions about ag tax you can um, take a look at that. Alright, let's talk about the financing documents. 
I just want to go through a couple of the typical financing documents in a purchase transaction. Um, first, you have your promissory note or a loan agreement. Um, people call this different things. Sometimes people just call it the note. Sometimes it's called the loan agreement. Basically, this is the same document. This is the document in which the borrower agrees to repay the debt. So your payment terms are going to be outlined. Um, it's going to have your escalation and balloon clauses if you have those. Make sure you understand it. Um, make sure you understand if you're not going to have um, a steady payment over the course of your loan, how the loan is going to escalate and when it's going to escalate. There will be references in the note or the loan agreement to how the um, agreement is secured. And normally that's done in a separate document. It's going to be done in your mortgage or your deed of trust. Um, again, these terms are used interchangeably. The deed of trust is the document in which the borrower transfers the title to the third party, the trustee in the document, um, to hold as security for the lender. When the loan is paid in full, the trustee transfers the title back to the borrower. And you should know that by signing this document, you're, if the, the borrower in this scenario, you're giving the lender the right to take back the property if the borrower fails to repay the loan as agreed. So this document um, can perplex folks because you, there's somebody named as a trustee in some instances, and you're like, who is this person? I've never heard of this person. What is this document, deed of trust? I've never heard this word. I've never heard this term before. Basically, it just means that although you're, you have um, the right to use your property and you own the equity in your property, you don't own the title in your property if it's secured through one of these documents. You're giving the title to somebody else, um, and you're not going to get that title back until the loan's totally repaid. This is the document that um, the lender is going to use to foreclose if they would need to foreclose. A couple things to think about with financing documents. Who is promising to make the payments? Who is named in the agreement and who is being asked to sign? Are you or someone else giving a personal guarantee? Are you signing in your individual capacity or are you signing on behalf of your entity? And here's my example. This can be very subtle, especially if you're at a real estate closing and you've signed 20 documents that day and you're, you're not even paying attention at that point anymore because you've just signed way too many things. It's important to think about with the financing documents and, and to um, take a breath and look at who is signing. If they're asking for Charlie Brown individually, then Charlie Brown is agreeing to make those payments. Or are they asking for Charlie Brown member Peanuts LLC? If Charlie Brown member Peanuts LLC is signing, he is signing on behalf of the Peanuts LLC, the limited liability company. So then the entity is making the promise. If he's signing Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown personally is making the promise. So if you're signing as an individual, you're giving a personal guarantee for the loan. You're acting as a guarantor. Sometimes it's clear on documents, they'll separate it and they'll be asking for a personal guarantee. Other times, it might not necessarily be so clear. So it's important to um, understand and ask the question. If you're buying the property, um, if an entity is buying the property, the lender, in many cases, is going to request a personal guarantee because the lender knows that in some instances, entities might be insolvent and that sometimes people set up entities without um, that because they you know might want to be able to walk away at some point from financial commitments. So if there's an entity involved in the purchase, a lot of times a personal guarantee is requested. And it's just important for everyone to understand that even if, if you're buying it with an entity, that the buyer is an entity, but a personal guarantee is requested, if you're signing in your personal capacity on those lending documents, don't misunderstand that um, you d understand rather that you actually have a personal obligation. Sometimes people think 
well, even if things go south with the transaction, it's okay because the entity bought the property. The entity's the owner. That may be true or may not be true depending on who signed those agreements to pay back that debt. So if an individual signed as a personal guarantor, even though the buyer was the entity, the lender's still gonna come after the person and personal assets could be attached in, um, in the event of a default. Okay, title policy. A title policy and title insurance is really a two-part transaction. The company or the attorney is gonna search the property records, um, in most cases 60 years, they'll do a 60 year search, so they'll go back 60 years in time, and they're gonna look to make sure there haven't been any errors, omissions in the deeds, unknown liens or fraud um, involved with the deed. They're verifying that the seller actually owns the property and has the legal authority to sell it. The entity doing the search um, then contracts with an underwriting company that's going to issue an insurance policy that's going to pay to defend the defend the buyer or the lender in court if anyone challenges the title. And they're um, hopefully going to cover a loss in that situation. Sometimes you'll have a, a buyer's policy, sometimes you'll have a lender's policy when it comes to title insurance. If there's only a lender's title, title policy insurance involved, make sure you understand that and consider whether or not you want to get your own buyer's title policy. Um, Read the exceptions to the policy and understand what's not covered. When you get that title insurance packet, you usually get a little packet or a folder from the title insurance company, the most important thing to read is what's not covered. It's um, normally fairly clear. Oftentimes the common things that are not covered are the things we've already talked about today that um, are on a buyer to figure out, and those include zoning, um, they often include um, acreage. So a title insurance policy, and I've seen folks make this mistake, title insurance does not ensure that you're buying 25 acres and that you're actually getting 25 acres. The title search is limited to the land records. They're going to go back deed by deed by deed, 60 years of deeds, and they're gonna make sure that every seller in that chain of title had the right to sell the property to the next buyer. They're not going to ensure that the acreage that's described in the deed is the actual acreage. And deed descriptions are recycled, meaning the lawyer that writes the deed today is gonna to look at the deed description that was written in the previous deed, and that lawyer looked at the one that was written in the previous deed. So a lot of times deed descriptions can be inaccurate. Um, and so it's really important just because you're getting title insurance not to forego other investigations um, that is your obligation as a buyer. Title policies are limited and what they're gonna, and what they cover and what they protect, just like any insurance policy. So just understand that and, and don't overestimate the coverage of a title policy. Um, they're important for their purpose um, in the transaction, but they're not gonna be more than what they say they are. All right, I have a question in the um, pod box, or the chat box. When signing for the personal guarantee, who claims the land during taxes, the entity or the person? When signing for the personal guarantee, who claims the land during, who pays the taxes? All the personal guarantee, I think, I'm not exactly sure if I understand the question, but I'll try to answer it. Um, the personal guarantee is just, it's just um, a pledge by an individual person to pay the debt if the entity fails to pay it. It's really never going to come into play or have any effect 
other than in the event of a default. So I brought it up and I talked about it in such detail because people forget that they give them. They forget that they sign those personal guarantee lines. Sometimes, you know, they'll ask a spouse to give a personal guarantee. It's sort of all over the map. But really, it's not going to affect anything else about the transaction. So if a, an entity is buying the property, the entity is going to be ultimately responsible for other things, um, in, such as tax payments. Um, all right, Victoria's got a question for me. What if the title policy makes an error on the deed because of fraudulent information? Um, the title policy, the, the deed is going to be drafted um, by, in some instances, by the title company. Um, and yes, title companies can make errors on deeds. Um, deed errors happen because, um, you know, human beings write the deeds and, and errors happen. Um, it kind of depends on the type of error you're asking about, but um, in most cases, um, if, the, if the property description is inaccurate, um, it's going to depend on what the seller what the seller was selling you and when the deed error occurred. If it's an old deed error, it, uh, it's sort of a different situation. Um, I might be able to answer that question in more detail if, um, if that question is emailed to me. So why don't you email me that question and then I, I hopefully can provide you with a more specific answer because it's really going to depend on the type of error. All right, let's talk about the closing. Um, buyers are responsible for settlement and closing costs unless negotiated otherwise. So it's important for a buyer to get an estimate and be prepared. Closing costs can be pretty substantial, um, in my opinion, uh, what I consider to be a substantial amount of money. So just it's important for buyers to be aware of it early on and to be financially prepared to be able to pay those settlement and closing costs if they haven't negotiated a different situation. And then sellers and buyers are going to split the recordation um, in state or local transfer taxes unless that is negotiated otherwise. And again, those um, depending on the pr um, the purchase price, those can um, those can get up there too. So make sure that you title companies can typically give you estimates for these costs early on in the process, and it's a good thing to ask for early on estimates on these so you can be prepared. All right, um, that's basically what I wanted to cover today. I did want to thank Bob Rich. Um, Bob's a ag realtor um, with Miller Commercial Real Estate, and I consulted Bob on this and asked him what, um, what he thought were some of the important farm purchase issues or transaction um, problems, and so he gave me some tips. So I wanted to give Bob a shout-out and say thank you. There is my email and my phone number. I'm happy to answer more questions. Um, that's what we do at the Ag Law Initiative. We help farmers throughout the state with their legal problems, so don't hesitate to reach out. And um, thank you all for listening today. Thank you for watching our archived presentation of our Wednesday webinar. If you would like to see more archived Wednesday webinars, please visit our YouTube channel or to find a schedule of upcoming live webinars, visit our website.